This better not make it in. <laughs> it's gonna be the like the pre credits bumper. Hey everyone, it's the Subtle Doctor. Um, welcome to this very, very special episode of What Are We This Show? An anime podcast that is very, very bad most of the time, but this time it's good because I'm joined by um, a very special guest. Oh, don't oversell it. By, by my my best friend, IRL best friend, uh, my life partner, uh, Annie is here. Wife. My wife. My wife. Also life partner. She has decided to join me for this uh, podcast in which we're going to be talking about... What are we going to be talking about? Uh, the movie Paprika. Right. Paprika. Pa- <laughs> I should settle on a pronunciation before we start talking about this. Paprika. Paprika. I don't think it matters. No, but if we both say it different, that's going to be weird. I've always that. said paprika. See, I know you have, but which of us is right? Paprika. That is. Paprika. That's that's no. That's how droids say it. All right. You're, are you are you paprika? Paprika. See. Is that the spice? Paprika. Oh. Okay, so we're both right. Paprika. Paprika. And so we're gonna talk about the Satoshi Khan film Paprika. Yes. And so the reason that uh, I wanted to do this is because seven years ago last month, uh, auteur and visionary anime film director, well, I should just say anime director because he's done feature-length films, television series, and short films, uh, Satoshi Khan, uh, you know, passed away uh, in August 2010. And there's going to be a Wave Motion Canon pod um, about Khan kind of, more of a broad view taking into account all of his works but i uh had never seen paprika and uh i thought that it would be a movie that annie might like um let me take a step back here for just a second and it it, i think it would be good if for the benefit of the listeners annie if we talk about you know they've they've heard me blabber on about anime for a while and what kind of anime fan i am um, but what's your relationship with anime? What do you like? What, how long have you been watching it? Well, I, I hold you down and force your eyes open to well, in front of the TV. <laughs> I've been a reluctant watcher ever since uh, I met Chuck Subs Doc, whatever people call him here. And it all I answer to all those names, but I refuse to call you Subs because it just. Sounds strange. I'm a pile of sandwiches. Yes. <laughs> yes. Doc is okay, even though it's kind of poserish because you don't actually I have don't. a doctor. <laughs> That's true. But anyway, so yes, Chuck was an anime fan, is an anime fan, and so he introduced me to the general, like, huge umbrella that is anime. After we started dating, yeah, I don't remember what the first Gosh. was. It Kenshin, maybe that's maybe that seems like if it was not the first, it's one of the first. <clears throat> the The issue is that we both have really terrible memories, so yeah, yeah, pretty sure that's right. And over the years, for whatever reason, sometimes I am reluctant to get into shows, not just anime, but shows in general, because it represents like a commitment and. I am not a commitment person besides, you know, being married and whatnot, (laughs) but, uh, so anyway, yes, yes, but, but all that, all that aside, I have still watched quite a few with Chuck and enjoyed many of, all of them, I think, that you've shown me. Yeah, I don't recall, well, I do recall famously me trying to show you Redline and you- Oh, was that the really, like, like, seizure-inducing one? 
I think so. It was the one that reminded you of the artist that was Liechtenstein. Yes, yes. That was. It was really all about the Ben Day graphic dot. and like <laughs> bright, overwhelming. <laughs> yes. Redline is all of those things. Anime fan Annie, this was your first Satoshi Kon film to see. I just don't even. Can I just express that I don't really feel worthy of the label of anime fan? I feel like. <laughs> People will take issue with that because I'm, I understand. Yeah, I'm right. super ignorant. Like I watch shows with you, and we talk about them, but I don't have any real sense of context or like wh- or history. There's no timeline for me. There is just what we watch together, and that's it. But you do have. A a very sharp critical eye and a literary background. Uh, You studied literary criticism, familiar with classical lit. And as such, I think you bring a really interesting perspective uh, to this sort of thing. And you're much smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to put this out there. It's a fact. So... Uh... So this movie, Paprika, was made in 2006. And just for the benefit of anyone that hasn't seen it, I'll go ahead and uh, try to surmise it real quick. Ooh, the, is, is it is it like kosher to read the Anime News Network summary? It is. Okay. Is that a good summary? I mean, it seems like short, but not too short. All right, let's. Why don't you take down from the top, and we'll do that. Okay. In the near future, a revolutionary new psychotherapy treatment called PT has been invented through a device called the DC Mini. It is able to act as a dream detective to enter into people's dreams and explore their unconscious thoughts. Before the government can pass a bill authorizing the use of such advanced psychiatric technology, one of the prototypes is stolen, sending the research facility into an uproar. In the wrong hands, the potential misuse of the device could be devastating, allowing the user to completely annihilate a dreamer's personality while they're asleep. Renowned scientist pronunciation... Dr. Atsuko Chiba. ...enters the dream world under her exotic alter ego, codename Paprika, in an attempt to discover who is behind the plot to undermine the new invention. That's another problem with me. I cannot pronounce... A lot of these names. Well, so. as listeners of Watery Death Show will know, I can't either. And Forkayla gives <laughs> me a lot of shit about that, uh, even though she can't pronounce them. <laughs> That's right. I'm calling you out, Val. Uh, the only other produ- like so this is a, a Satoshi Kon movie um, uh, produced by Studio Madhouse. Um, that's usually all people say about it. But I just did want to quickly give a shout out. A shout out. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, Asuko Chiba and her alter ego Paprika are voiced by the incredibly famous and amazing Seiyu Megumi Hayashibara of Slayer's fame and whatnot. Uh, She does an excellent job in this film, really crushes it, in my opinion. I did appreciate the voice acting. There's so much going on (laughs) here in this movie. Uh, And of course, we're going to spoil it uh, to death. So if you haven't seen it and care about that, I would advise you to go watch it. Stop! Go (laughs) watch the movie. You can watch it on uh, Anime Strike uh, if you're a subscriber to that service. Um, Not sure where else it's streaming, but it's definitely there. Um, Annie, what are like the big impressions for you? Um... Like when you think of Paprika, what are going to be some some scenes you think of, or some ideas that um, that hit you? Well, that is a question I can answer because for me, the very first word that pops into my head and that will uh, that just sort of summarizes everything about it to me is reconciliation. I mean, it's everywhere in the movie, but. I, primarily, I would say it springs from this idea of our conscious and our subconscious, like our, our repressed desire and our desire to control and how all of those things, in order to be a whole person, you need to find some kind of reconciliation there. And 
if either one of them rules the day, you will get unmitigated disaster. But um, there's a there's a a sanity in the balance. Is this chiefly coming to mind because of the kind of split and subsequent unity of Atsuko and Paprika? Well, I mean, I think that is, of course, that's like the prime, uh, the prime image that you get, I guess, I guess. Perhaps the final, like kind of the denouement, a part of that as well? Yes, yes, because I think the important thing is that it's bigger than Paprika, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and Atsuko. I mean, she, she's the main character, so her sort of incorporation into herself is important but i think that that end battle or it's not really a battle but that end scene in the dream world slash real world the 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 coming together of those two that that the way it all finishes up the finale no but it's not see because it's not the finale of the movie oh what do you call this part Yes. Well, I called it the denouement the, the, because the, it felt like the, the climax, climax yes. <laughs> yes. of the invasion of the dream world. That image is, it's, I mean, they make it very clear, of course, when you do life and death and, you know. Man and even, woman. It, man and woman. And so you have, you know, at that point. Which can I just say, that's a, I mean. I guess those are opposite things. <laughs> Which just you'd hate to like imagine you're putting things into groups and you're like life and light and man go on this side, darkness, death and woman go on the other side. <laughs> like I mean I can see how that's potentially problematic, but I think that the movie does a great job because it's not that all all of the one type of character is represented by the male characters and all of the other type of character is represented by yes. the female character. That they, they All of them have these aspects of themselves. And really, in the extreme forms, they almost lose themselves in each other in, in this chaotic way. So, like, when you have the chairman as his ultimate evil whatever, he wants to control everything. I mean, that's really his, like, that's what he is high on, this idea that he can, he has life and death, the power of them in his hands, and he can control everyone's dreams, he can control. But of course, in his desire for control, he he is chaos, because he really, by virtue of being a human being, you can't control everything effectively and in a way that is not chaotic but despite the fact that you have chaos and you have control they're both there but they're not reconciled in his form and so what you need in that end scene is a being who who represents the full desire for reconciliation so what she does which is part of what I love about it. What she does is not destroy him. I mean, not 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 by virtue of like a battle and knocking things down and throwing. But she incorporates him. She sucks him into herself, and and that is what fixes everything. That's incorporation. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. So that's something you said a moment ago. Uh, I was struck by when the chairman says to Paprika and then says to, I think, the cop uh, as well, to um, to Kanakawa in the greenhouse, the chairman himself says, like, that he's trying to, like, the reason he sabotaged the DC Mini was because he wants to preserve, like, the sanctity and I guess the sort of naturalness of the dream world. Like he sees it as a space, like here's a space where technology hasn't come and made, it hasn't set itself up and made things artificial. It hasn't um, commoditized it or anything. And it's this, it's this sacred place. So what I'm going to do 
is sabotage sabotage this technology but really i'm going to monopolize the technology and i'm going to use it so that no one else can use it i'm going to guard the dream world and but by by doing that right he's ensured that it will become corrupted because it's no it's no longer the kind of organic um phenomenon and natural thing that it always was before so it's like what what do you do if you're the chairman and you lament the kind of marching of technology into all these spaces where it wasn't before um which i think is a very relevant thing to think about even like today like 11 years later from when this movie was made like is he supposed to kind of resign himself and just say well uh heretofore like this has been this paradise and amazing thing but i guess now the bulldozers are here i have to let them clear the forest away and set up a mini mall and the equivalent of doing that to dreams i like, mean yeah no no i mean that's not okay if i pronounce anything wrong it's chuck's fault because <laughs> i don't have a clue um, and he's telling me how to pronounce everything. <clears throat> Tokada. <clears throat> so all that really matters is how well am I imitating him? I mean, if I'm imitating him well, then there's no fault with me. So anyway, I I think what you're saying is so important. And I'm going to sound like a broken record because we kind of already talked about this in the context of another show that we just watched. But so important. I think one of the one of the series of opposites that you could see being reconciled in this movie was the idea of innocence and experience. So you have um, Tokita, who represents innocence, childhood. He doesn't, you know, he has to be kind of pushed into taking responsibility, into taking steps to become like an adult, even though he is an adult, but, you know, mentally yes. take those steps. Yes. And that's part of also what is so cool about that last scene because Paprika, as she comes out to have this, you know, confrontation with this big representation of control, she's a child. What happens when she starts to suck in this desire for control? Ah. She becomes an adult. Yes. You know, and that is really important. You know, that's a huge, um, again, just a, a, a huger overarching picture of this whole idea that what it takes to mature, to deal with those problems in a way that is responsible is to neither deny the innocence or the experience, to incorporate both and to mature into a human, a fully formed human who can deal with the problems with both things in mind. Because if, if, you, if you feel that, like the chairman, is it okay to call him the chairman? Is that yeah, right? yeah. Okay, we'll just call him the chairman. Yeah. I, did they is. even say his name? I don't even remember. You just called him the chairman, so yeah. that's what I called him. I mean, that's he's, is he, he is chairman? the chairman, absolutely. Okay. Chairman of the board there of the yes. science place. Yes, yes. <laughs> anyway, that's his problem, you know, is that he is not willing to incorporate innocence. You know, he's all experience. He's all control. He's all adult. And you have, you know, Tokita... He's all innocence. He's all, um, you know, whim and, and uh, you know, going with his, his feelings and doing what feels right without any attempt to Isn't it think about how it will affect the world. And so those are, those are both problematic. And in the meantime, you have Paprika slash Atsuko who is trying to reconcile both and she hasn't figured it out instead her personality is split into two human beings you know her id and her super ego or whatever it is um and so of course 
as much as she's doing and she is working toward a solution, she can't really find that solution until she fuses those parts of herself and that enables her to kind of fix the problem. So you think the chairman in wanting to like safeguard dreams as a as a kind of sort of natural place. I think that protecting innocence at all costs yes. can become mon- monstrous and he's a representation of that. I I think I mean he I don't think he Again, I think he he represents experience fully and totally. But I think he has some sort of appreciation for innocence as represented in his desire for purity and dreams. However, uh, the means that he wants to use to Purity's preserve that, and 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 that is also you know again the idea of adolescence into adulthood. Although we have to recognize the value of innocence, to try to maintain innocence at all costs is incredibly damaging Mm -hmm. so yes so yes as you see in the chaos that is this world yeah you really have to accept both both parts um you know and, and where the chairman i feel became monstrous as you say because he wanted to preserve innocence at all costs kanakawa like he he just wanted to push his innocence away the whole time, I feel. That time when he mm. was making movies with his best friend. He mm-hmm. knew what he wanted to do. Uh, and then, you know, tragedy befell him. His friend died. Uh, he felt he had betrayed him because he didn't finish their film. And so he completely diverted his career path, like became a cop. Um, doesn't like to think about movies at all always wants to push the time when he was 17 out of his mind like so he's kind of on the other end of of the scales there and uh i really liked his character arc i thought it was pretty interesting i liked it a lot and i liked his character a lot and i think that's yeah that's the perfect way to fit him into this puzzle like he is pained by his innocence and he can't accept it you yeah. know, he can't accept that he didn't bear any responsibility, that he was innocent. He has created this vision of himself as in control, but not not with a desire to control, but a desire to control himself um, and, and not remember a time when he didn't. Mm-hmm. A desire um, to, like, he wants, he wants to put that responsibility on himself. Like, he keeps seeing as sort of, He's working on a homicide, and so the kind of uh, perspective in his dream and and the the shots, if you will, in his dream are of that homicide. But he's really thinking about his friend's death, and he he wants so badly to be responsible for it in some way. I think, and that's why he at at some point imagines that he's holding the smoking gun. He says that he killed himself. It means like the other part of himself, his friend. So, so yeah, I think, yeah, he's trying to control. That might be the thing he's maybe or, trying or to control. Or maybe to an, uh, uh, an attempt to deal with his, the moment that represents loss of innocence in his life. Again, as contrasted with experience. That was the moment that, the moment that his innocence died the moment that his friend died and he felt responsible and felt that there was nothing he could do about it, in a sense, he he worked to kill that innocence in himself. So in a way, he killed oh, himself. Oh, yes, 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 that's you know, yeah. he mm. killed He killed any memory of who he was at that time because it was too painful. Um, he denied that part of himself. And disaster for him. So many disasters. Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, it's, gosh, so much personal tragedy because these people can't accept themselves. To answer my own question that I asked you a few minutes ago, what, kind of big picture, what do you think of if someone says, hey, Chuck, Paprika? I think the thing that would come to my mind first, and it's probably because 
I have seen a few other uh, Satoshi Kon movies. Uh, by the way, I haven't seen all of Satoshi Kon's work. Blasphemous. <laughs> I know. Um, you might say that I am innocent of his work <laughs> in your experience. Yes. yes, I still need to see his television series, Paranoia Agent. I have seen all of his feature films and the short film, um, Magnetic Rose. That it's he okay, on. you don't have to justify yourself to anyone. I do. They're rabid. I have to. I have to constantly be. You don't know what it's like. You have to keep showing your cred, or they'll eat you alive. So the thing, the thing that I will think of is, uh, it's that man Khan really, really loves to play with the border between the real and the unreal. I mean, there are just some very specific moments in the movie. In the, in the middle, in particular, where I just, I really, really didn't know, is what I'm seeing the real world, or is it in a dream? And again, this is kind of a hallmark of, of his work, uh, certainly in Perfect Blue, Millennium Actress, anyway. Yeah, I'm wondering if you think the big theme of reconciliation, certainly we see it has to do with the reconciling of the different parts of yourself, your, your innocence and experience and acceptance. Is he trying to say something about dreams and reality also? That you sort of, that both are necessary and to indulge in either to the neglect of the other is damaging in some way? Well, again, I mean, I, I used the idea of innocence and experience because I think it's it's symbolic a lot in the movie and, and um, it's part of the, the bigger picture. But of course, I think the dream versus reality has to do, again, with the conscious and the subconscious. That there are all these parts of ourselves that we suppress because they're terrifying. Um mm. Can I just say that the scene with the massive doll oh my looking God. in the window oh and then it shrieked <laughs> like that might be the most horrifying thing I've ever seen on film. And I loved it <laughs> because, I mean, I, I told Chuck too. I mean, I keep going off on tangents in That's, the middle of my larger tangent. This but is good. Like the... From the first dream sequence, I mean, because the movie starts out with one, it was one of the best depictions that I've ever seen of dreams. You yeah. know, it's something that's used a lot in shows, films, whatever. And a lot of times they just don't really ring true for me. They're they're either not bizarre enough or they have too much of a plot. And I don't know, <laughs> it was just something about... The combination of slow motion blurry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, that my dreams are vivid. They are profoundly disturbing. They're violent. They're graphically sexual. Like they're very. They are. I mean, yes, they are the id. They are. They are out there, and they're. You know, they they represent that side of yourself that you really try to shove down. Um. Or is at least a part of them. And so anyway, anyway, so uh, the content, but also the visuals that were, you know, not cloudy, not foggy. They're crisp and clear and the colors are bright. And, um, and yeah, everything is just sort of in, sh in stark relief and you, you can't miss any of it. I, I loved, I loved how the dreams were portrayed. I think it was really well done. So, but anyway. Can I say real quick, yeah, though? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I just talk about terrifying in the first dream sequence when the little girl is running up to the giant birdcage, but she has the face of the adult. <laughs> that is that is profoundly disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we should think about like the most disturbing dream moment. <sighs> yeah, those are some pretty terrifying ones, but there were a lot. But gosh, but, I so, wouldn't even know where to. So anyway, the dream yeah. versus reality. The sub. I I totally lost the thread of where I was going. But yes, Sorry, it definitely represents 
that subconscious and the conscious and how we have to reconcile those two things. And I mean, those aren't the same as innocence and experience at all. They're, they represent right. a whole different, I mean, cause again, I like, I like again, that they were talking about the opposites right before she runs out to do her thing in the end. Um, it's about reckon. That's why reconciliation is the word I picked because it's not just about the one thing and the other thing or this and that or the subconscious and the conscious, the innocence and the experience, whatever. It's it's everything getting reconciled. All mm. the parts that make us human, the ones that are scary to us. Not just the duality. The but ones like, that, but, yeah. but they've all got to come together um, in order to live a life that is worth living. So... How do you... How does one even begin to reckon, like reconcile their own subconscious i guess that's what therapists are paid for i mean right? yeah <laughs> like in real life i mean not being afraid i think like fear is a driver of a lot of a lot of the bad <laughs> that happens in the world and in the movie in the world of the movie you know um the chairman is afraid of what things will be like you know, if the dream world is taken over te by technology and I mean, everybody's scared of something mm -hmm. and that distorts reality. What do you think Otsuko is scared of? Uh, she's scared of her own feelings, I think. Yeah. You know, same. sort of why she acts so cold. Mm -hmm. Wait, who is who's the guy who really likes her, but he's also the chairman's oh, kind oh, of flunky. Yes. Yes. We haven't really talked about him at all. Yeah. Uh, so do you have something to... <laughs> I just feel like we need to talk about him. I mean, he's very much just the, like to me, just sort of represents the, um, like someone who is controlled by his physical desire. You know, he seems yeah. to be primarily motivated. And, and in the end, he succumbs to, to the chairman because he's weak, because he's letting his physical desire... Um, take over his desire for other things. And so, yes, he's someone who hasn't reconciled anything. And there's like a, there's kind of a coming together that is not, that I wouldn't classify as reconciliation, that I think maybe the movie, the the movie wants to call, I don't know if perverse is the right word, but certainly like, the, the movie frowns upon w when it's a coming together of not like you're not reconciling parts of yourself but the the chairman wants to take you know the things about him his own life experience his mind his personality and merge that with the the physical traits and characteristics of osanai you know he wants he said that body belongs to me it's mine like once i have that like then perfection you know then then i'll uh, I'll be set uh, to to run the board, <laughs> to yeah. chair the board forever. Yeah, I mean, that's maybe like a <laughs> bastardization of the idea. You know, maybe that represents the fact that it, taking the kingdom by violence, you know what I mean? Trying, it's not so much an attempt at reconciliation. It's just sort of a forcing of what you want. Yeah. Like he sees other humans as uh, objects, to bend to his will. Yeah. And in his mind, it's to accomplish this greater purpose, but but you end up, yeah, just yeah, treating people not like humans. It's not a matter of acceptance at that point. Like you said, it's violence. It's it's swallowing up. It's using yeah, uh, it's people more, as means. It's, it's really, it, actually, that is a really good, now I'm thinking about um, Himuro. Yeah. Like, you, the chairman uses people up and then cast them aside. Like that is his, that is not incorporation. It's, it's like parasitism. You know what I mean? Like he sucks that guy dry and then he sucks Osanai mm -hmm. dry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and then he's dead in the end. Like, or I don't, does he really die? I think yeah, so. Yeah, what the hell? I, I think <laughs> It, he, the point is, he was in a bad way. Yeah, <laughs> and he um, done. He gone. So that's what he he goes around just like yes, just feeding off of people, but not incorporating himself into them. 
if that can't, makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so this is an interesting thing I wanted to get. Like, is that possible? The movie's saying it's a good thing to accept and reconcile and come together in harmony and acknowledgement of the different kind of parts of yourself, different aspects of the reality that is you, right? Of your, of your whole person, to become a whole person. Is it possible for two separate persons to come together in that way? Like, is that... Is that maybe the message that like that two like two others can't <clears throat> will one always be subsuming the other, I guess? I don't think that's what I, I mean, I don't think the movie's really going there. Yeah. I, like to me that it, it's just a represent it's a representation of the kind of force that the chairman is is um is using or, or the kind of the kind of person that he is. He's a person who um, sort of feeds off of the blood of other people. I don't. I don't think there's. I don't think there's any attempt for I him see. to reconcile himself with this other individual. Right. I, I think he's just feeding off of him. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's. I don't think that's that's uh, significant to yes. the, the story in yeah. that way. I don't think it's trying gotcha. to say anything. And I do. I mean, I hesitate to. Although there are these huge themes and um, and there's a lot that's cohesive, I never like to reduce yeah, a movie or a that. book or whatever to like. He's just trying to say this, you know. Like <laughs> if I everything mean, can be like put under this, like right. It's not like everything is a symbol of something, and you know. I mean, yes, it's a lot more complex than that. But th- those are the things that stick with you. So yeah, I would be hesitant is, to take everything <laughs> as significant. Um, you know, everything lends to the mood and drives the story, but it's not necessarily like serving of a a, a moral. Yeah, I think an, another thing I wanted to touch on because because Khan always, I think, has a character like this in in his movies, like the obsessive the very very far gone nerd <laughs> because <laughs> khan himself is an otaku um so he kind of i guess understands the personality type but um tokita is this i think to uh, for a uh, uh, he's like sort of this but i think himido like when they walked into his office you know or his workspace in his, maybe it was his home even like it was just it's so funny because like to him to walk through there is to walk through like this place that is full of things you love and things that make you happy but where I was looking around I was kind of horrified seeing Himuro's like unchecked obsession and like how just how it looked to me and how it manifested in the dream of the doll and the giant doll like being horrific like that was really interesting to me because because Khan is a big nerd and an obsessive but he's willing to acknowledge like it it can go to very dark places but also you have uh, Tokita who is also, you know, a nerdy guy. You know, when he takes off his lab coat, he's wearing a robot shirt. Um, he spends his time in a very, you know, slobby office working on gadgets, um, inventing things. Like, but, you know, he's part of the solution in the end. Like, he gets it. Um, and I have enjoyed Khan's commentary on those types of people uh in his other movies yeah that scene where where she kind of lets loose on him it's like way harsh ty man that's a mean girl's reference (laughs) just in case you didn't get it but yeah but it was good because it 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 ushered him in to a new way of thinking that he needed to be ushered into what was what were they discussing in the car on that scene um, in the rain? It was her and the old guy. Oh, right. Super vague. 
Right. Aren't they talking about, um, aren't they discussing, they're, they're finding out there's a collective sort of dream? I feel like that's important because as like literally merging talk is happening, the little rain on the window comes together. And that, I feel like we could talk for seven hours about all the little moments that were just sort of rich with symbolism. I mean, obviously, it's a movie about dreams. So you've got the end when the parade's going on, and you have, you know, it starts with the businessmen throwing themselves off the building. You know, this already who get this sense of abandon. Mm -hmm. And then you've got these, you know, everything is just chaos, but you've got religious figures. You've got symbols of luck. And they're all just kind of going apeshit together. Like, I just, I love that. The parade scenes were always really neat. Uh, yes, and we pretty much need to address that. Imuro, mm-hmm. he had the best music in his dreams. Because <laughs> the... <laughs> like, I'm going to have to look it up and just listen to it during the week because it made me happy i the music that i enjoyed the most uh was when uh paprika entered the collective dream uh as you know as the monkey king riding on the cloud with the staff and but she's falling from the sky at first it's like i think it's the main theme of the movie very like sort of electronica with some like chanting that's really that that's one that'll stick with me i really liked that song see and that's like uh, uh, that's why i feel like we need like a week to sit down and research this because it's like i'm sure that is significant you know what does the monkey king represent right you know, i i'm sure it's significant i'm sure what's well, certainly like, a so things. It, i believe it's part of the journey to the west which is one of the oldest novels um that we know of um a very very old chinese novel and so it's a very popular story so maybe it's just another one of the fictional or fantastical characters that make up the parade that the chairman was you know angry that were being discarded mhm and that was one of the things he wanted to preserve like you said was the innocence like the land of of fairies and magic and things that you know in our present cold reality you know in the world of adults we kind of have left behind interesting i just don't know enough about it to watch more dragon ball <laughs> <laughs> i'm a huge dragon ball fan no greater falsehood will be uttered on this microphone. <laughs> so I found the the whole notion of like a collective dream to be really fascinating. It's a really alluring idea, but it's really difficult for me to wrap my mind around uh, thinking about a dream without thinking about who's having it primarily or a place without thinking about like where is it instantiated in material reality when the dc mini it just starts gobbling up these these dreams or smooshing them together and they kind of snowball into this giant big collective dream that is just really like eating other dreams around it a lot like you spoke about the chairman doing in reality like it's just kind it's kind of frightening um in some ways just think about like this roving sort of dream substance that could pull you in and away from the reality that you know and just thinking about like what it is and i mean it's just such a foreign idea that that I I just find really fascinating to think about. Like, what what are your thoughts on the the whole collective dream business? Where is all this happening? You know, because if okay, if 
your dream and my dream. Well, I just don't feel like that's something that requires explanation in the movie for me. Uh, no, I mean, yeah. it's just no, sort of, sure. it just sort of represents how things were spinning out of control. Um, and that reality and dream were merging. It wasn't happening in a separate place from reality. And that's what was so scary. Terrifying. Like it was, it was everything, but not cohesive not accepting, not not incorporated, just strewn about on the floor with no thought and nothing something. I don't know what I was going to say. <laughs> Two things that need to merge. Sometimes, you know, when you just talk for too long and you're like, why are words still coming out of my mouth? Because yes. I already said what I wanted to this say. This frequently happens to me. Yes, yes. As you all know. So another thing that really caught my attention is when they mentioned, I forget which character it was that uh, they introduced the idea that the internet was analogous to the dream world, that it might like sort of help or categorize like, what is the dream world? Uh, where is it? What is it like uh, that the internet could be? Like a helpful device for that. I just I thought that was super interesting. Yeah, I think it. I think it was um, a quote from Atsuko saying, "Okay, she said, don't you think dreams and the internet are similar? They're both areas where the repressed conscious mind vents." So yeah, I mean, hmm. there was a lot of incorporation of technology. Um, and a comparison between the way we conduct ourselves in the technological realm, especially on the internet, and how we conduct ourselves in dreams and sort of the unfettered nature that both of them share um, because we're less guarded and we feel like we're in a place where we can release whatever subconscious you know thought comes to us because we have the protection of anonymity on the internet and of course we have no control in dreams so yeah and of course uh kunakawa you know the way they access his dreams that have been recorded is through a computer mm -hmm. you know it's very web-based and um of course, the the DC Mini is a machine. Right. Well, I, I certainly do often feel like I'm in a dream when I'm scrolling through YouTube comment sections. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a but, nightmare. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's not like a like a one to one thing, but just how it's like this sort of the internet is kind of got one foot in the world of dreams and one foot in the kind of concrete reality. And I think it seems to be important in the movie to not give yourself with abandon to any one thing. So to lose yourself in the technological in such a way that you disconnect with the physical world is another right. one of those dichotomies, you know, that the movie would not want you to be fully invested on either end of, you know, don't fear technology, but don't neglect the real world. And it will just do everything damage if you fail in the balance of those things. So were you satisfied by, by the, by the movie? I mean, very much. I loved it. I loved everything about it. I loved the look of it. I love the design. Yeah, we haven't talked about that I much. I love the, um, gosh, I love the colors. They were just so saturated. Very. Um, it just made it feel very almost three dimensional. I don't know. I don't know. It was just really good. <laughs> I'm actually looking at pictures of the movie because I want to remember things. Oh, another thing that I think is like the the 
Here's, I, I think a way that the idea of intrapersonal things, inter, interpersonal or intrapersonal, which is, which is within oneself and which is from person to person. Person to person will be interpersonal. Okay, so the interpersonal incorporation could be signified, you know, by the coming together of Atsuko and Tokita. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, because he in his self represents lack of self-control and she kind of represents personal control. You know, again, she's not trying to control anyone else but her own self. She has a very tight rein on. She's portrayed, spoken about as cold, you know, reserved. She's very just tight. Always wearing the suit, always wearing the heels, always got the hair tightly pulled mm-hmm. back. He orders, you know, five courses for himself. You know, he does whatever he wants. <laughs> he eats whatever he wants. He makes whatever he wants. He represents that just absolute abandon. And so... Each of them gives the other the ability to come to a realization that they are incomplete. Not even not even just without each other, but within their own selves. I, and I like that. It's not that they just come together as these two separate forces and like they cancel out something in each other or they reconcile it with each other. They actually help each other become whole as separate people. Mm. You know, although they do end up coming together. And I loved that. That's really great. And I just, I love surrealism. I love bizarre things. You know, this was, this <laughs> movie, you know, pause it at any point and it would make a great surreal piece of art. Um, there, of course, you know, yes, there's going to be so much symbolism in something like that. And I do, I mean, and I might, you know, just start looking stuff up. Like, you know, what is the significance of this in dreams? Because even though I'm sure, you know, like we talked about, it's not like everything means something. That's not how stories work. But for the surrealists who were obsessed with dreams, you know, and the significance of dreams and how they related to the subconscious and what they showed about us because they were unfettered, um, symbolism was really important to them. And so I am absolutely positive, you know, based on what you've told me of this person and the way that he chose to express these ideas that he had, I'm sure a lot of it is significant and symbolic. Um, For sure. And I'd be definitely interested to know more about it. So thematically, the movie very satisfying. Like aesthetically very satisfying. Um, brilliant film. Through and through. I think we both agree. Um, did you hit a point where Atsuko or Konakawa woke up from yet another dream within a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream that you were like, well... I just kind of give up trying to figure it. Like, what, did you ever find that um, frustrating at all? Like, that the film wouldn't let you ca- anchor down and reflect on the border between reality and dreams? Like, it was always like, you never know where you are, or like, you're in a dream again. Like, you can't, you can't settle and trust uh, what's what's around you. Like. Because at any moment, a character could sit up in bed again. Like, did that ever... Did you ever feel that way? Uh, short answer, no. Long answer, nope. <laughs> okay. Did you feel that way, Chuck? I, I, you know, I <laughs> hit a point where... At, I don't remember when exactly it was. It was in the last sort of quarter, the last fifth of the movie... I think right before dreams and reality were just openly bleeding into each other, like where I was kind of like, okay, again, (laughs) it, it, you know, I, I recall feeling that way, uh, seeing inception. Um, but it was a very minor sort of, uh, frustration, like, 
very, very easy to overlook, very easy to swallow that. I don't think it's a deal breaker or a mark against the film in any way. It was just a feeling I had. Okay, here's a question I have for you. Shoot. What was the most horrifying thing that happened in the movie? I mean, doll screaming aside, unless that is literally the most horrifying thing that happened. No, I mean, that's sort of comically funny, horrifying, but definitely when people's dreams had been invaded, uh, but we were looking at it from the outside and they were just started talking nonsense Mm -hmm. and their eyes got really wide and they were all smiling, Mm -hmm. proclaiming nonsense and, you know, often with like weapons or pieces of technology, (laughs) they're just things they would pick up and, you know, they would hurt themselves, hurt other people. I mean, it was just seeing them you know it looked like go crazy i guess like have a some sort of psychotic episode was pretty disturbing Mm -hmm. so i think for me it's those i'm i'm certainly i'm very glad that they actually showed one of those things happen and then uh a character come out on the other side of that and be be fine actually that was kind of that was sort of important for me that that happened and it not always be a road to ruin for any character how about you what was the what was the single most uh kind of Um, scary well definitely i would say single most horrifying thing was what was a i mean i would almost call it a rape scene i mean Mm. the incredibly sexually yeah. violent oh. scene where she was on the table and he was ripping you know ripping her apart and even though oh. even though i think she had not incorporated herself with paprika that that just that was another show of the unnatural nature of violence you know like it was you know we talked earlier about all of the violence of the attempt to control and i think that was a disturbing and powerful idea or or incorporation of that idea that rather than finding wholeness in desire the way it can rip a person rip even the object of your desire apart you know, so that what he was desiring wasn't even actually her. You know, yeah. it was this image he had created of her, um, which is, I think, part of why he sort of ripped her apart because it wasn't only one aspect of her personality yep. was the object of his desire. And so he forcibly removed the aspect of her personality that he didn't desire which again is just it's just a further illustration Mm. that what he wanted was not her yeah there was no interest in it was just about his own personal desires and what he had imagined for himself like sating whatever thirst he had in that in that way like uh, yeah i mean that's a really interesting like so the intensity and and selfishness of his desire with no no inclination of acceptance or her will like just how even that desire was destructive to the person or like from his point of view the object of his desire yeah because it was not about a person at all he had objectified her completely yeah i mean that was well and truly like that was just just disgusting (laughs) that was certainly the most disgusting thing i think that i saw and just what a that that is a way i mean perhaps perhaps that could be done uh in live action film but i think and khan is really a master at this like showing a high concept scene like that in a very simple and elegant way like 
through animation Mm -hmm. i think is kind of just astonishing i think he does it in every one of his films like you can pick out these scenes like in in this case it's osanai destroying you know doing violence upon Asuka by ripping her out of the you know ripping her away from these other aspects the paprika aspects of her personality like it's just i mean what what an image and and how loaded and that it's it, he's just khan is just this um real talent he, he had such a talent of like doing these things that you could only do with animation and i'm not i'm not the sort of person who says that like oh a piece of like art only has value if it's taking advantage of these unique aspects of its medium. Like I don't, I don't think that's the case. But man, Khan really should be like championed and applauded for using the unique aspects of his medium to convey his vision in a really, really powerful way. Um, and if I can go back to to that scene, I just want to say that. I really feel like it was foreshadowed as well. So she, you know, very, it was quite early in the movie, yeah. She does the same kind of thing, reaching into him, but rather than doing violence to him, you know, she's bringing him back to himself. So it, it's just another contrast of between types of human beings. The type of people who, even though maybe they aren't fully incorporated within themselves, they're interested in wholeness as opposed to these people who are only interested in their own selfish acts in such a way that it keeps them from viewing other human beings as human beings. Also, interestingly... You know the part where she turns into the Sphinx? Yeah. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. And she mm-hmm. calls him Oedipus. Oedipus, right. Mm-hmm. That is actually, and I'm sure, I mean, it's not like the, like this is new for us, but I'm sure there's been a trillion and one things written about this. But um, Gustave Moreau in 1864 painted Oedipus and the Sphinx, and that was the reference in the oh. movie. And I think that who's, I mean, that was sort of the chairman sort of um it's so hard to tell at that point what is the other guy the osanai Osanai. it was kind of their collective dream because he had sort of subsumed himself to the chairman you know at this point they're kind of both contributing to this dream his head pops out of his shoulder (laughs) and so it's it's very interesting to me yes i'm remembering the story correctly I mean, it's very significant because in that story of Oedipus and the Sphinx, okay, the Sphinx has asked him a riddle and, you know, everyone else has not gotten the riddle correct and he does. And so she kills herself. And I think it, it's just another thing that contributes the image of his vision of himself as um as the hero of the story and her as this sort of mystical other that he desires but also wants to do violence to Uh, you know because in the end of that story she's dead and he's the hero so i thought it was interesting that movies were were kind of as big a part of the story as as they are um so one of khan's other films millennium actress is all about films um but paprika is chiefly about dreams but they spend a lot of time focusing on on movies do you i hate to put you on the spot because like i i feel like there's something there that there's some sort of you know parallel or now maybe you know you were talking about how do we reconcile these things maybe the incorporation of movies and their importance in all of this gestures as you said to the idea that art is a way to begin to reconcile those things 
to tell those stories, to confront things visually or musically or whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> maybe that's a first step. Yes. Like, and at, at, there's a couple of really significant lines at the end, right, where where they talk about life imitating art, right? Like the the truth that came from fiction and to remember yes. the, all the truth and remember the fiction. Yes. Like, yes. Perhaps there's another line that we feel is hard and fast that Khan wants us to think is perhaps not so much, you know, the the art life line that, you know, they're always influencing each other and where does one begin and the other end? Like, I don't know. It's Yes, art is necessary. It's a necessary um, element of reconciliation. So, like, to be a whole person, I mean, like, aesthetics and art are a large part of that? I think it's how humanity wrestles with things. I mean, for all time, it's kind of been that way, Um, which is part of why, you know, I like the... But but again, the, the uh, the symbolism of the dreams is so significant. So you have things like the story of Oedipus and the Sphinx. I mean, that is an ancient story wrestling with ideas and you know again i don't i don't necessarily think that's why that was there we talked earlier about why that was significant but it's just another illustration that for all time we've been working through heavy problems with art with story with visual art with music becoming more complete humans because it is a sort of a safe space you can say things in your art that you you simply cannot say as a human seeking to live a um a life without conflict among other humans you know you you can't Mm. you do suppress all those things Mm -hmm. and i mean wow Art is a way to to sort of let those things go traditionally. I mean, it's not the only function of it, but it has been a function of it for a long time. Oh, it's so true. <laughs> oh. My own, I guess, my own summation of the film. I mean, I'll just be restating some things I already said because, I mean, you've really put it better than I ever could have and that's why i'm so happy to have you here seriously on talk about it like because i don't know con's work has always been the kind of thing that i have i have watched and i look upon it and i say like wow here is something profound and kind of mysterious and beautiful but like sussing out like what's um what I think is happening or like coming up with overarching themes and categories besides the whole, like, you know, playing with real versus unreal, um, which is pretty overt. Like, uh, you know, a lot of the other stuff kind of tends to elude me with con and, um, and that's, you know, my own like shortcoming as a, as a critic, I think for, for providing just, uh, like a banquet of food for thought and a wealth of stunning and beautiful and disturbing imagery. Like, I think this is a film to not be ignored in Khan's catalog uh, by any means. It's a, it's a wonderful work. Do people ignore it? I think, like, it's not one of his um, most heralded works. I think when people put together their... You know, unfortunately, the filmography of Satoshi Khan is criminally short because the universe hates us all and took him from us uh, when he was in his 40s. But, you know, if you're ranking his stuff, I I just I feel like most people are going to talk about Perfect Blue and Millennium Actress as their favorites. And I'm I'm there, too. Like, I, I love Perfect. Perfect Blue is his favorite film that I've seen this I think is is just under that um 
as much as I as I appreciate his other works. I loved everything about it. There wasn't a single thing I didn't love about it. We have a new Satoshi Kon van here. Well, that I think is going to do it for our our Paprika discussion. Um, again, see this movie if you've not seen it. It's glorious. Um, Annie, thanks so much for being here on Watery Death Show with uh, me, your your doting but baka husband. <laughs> so self-deprecating. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Like, I, it's sort of humbling, and uh, I don't feel worthy to appear on your program, but well, I certainly enjoyed talking about the movie. Well, I have the feeling that this is going to be just the first of many of of such podcasts so get ready for that folks if you want to uh, get in contact with the show if you like this hated it want to see more of this type of uh discussion i won't read the review so don't hold back You know, a discussion of two people in the same room, you know, not Skyping internationally, which is... Not that there's anything wrong with Skyping internationally. Watery Desho, W-A-R-U-I-D-E-S-H-O-U at gmail.com is how to email us. Or you can reach us on Twitter at Watery Desho. Uh, You can find me on Twitter at The Subtle Doctor. Uh, I have a curious cat, curiouscat.me slash The Subtle Doctor if you want to ask a question that is more long form or receive a response from me that is longer than 140 characters. Um, but yeah, please uh, give us some feedback on this. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, thanks all uh, so much for listening. Thanks for listening. And remember, embrace each other, everyone, to the ends of the universe. The universe. <laughs>